Morning. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we uh, well, I think have a really exciting and informative panel. Uh, we're really uh, pleased to talk about uh, a study that the CAQ commissioned. Uh, we had uh, Susan Schultz from the University of Kansas do an in-depth analysis of financial restatements for the last 10-year period immediately following the, the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley. So the study period is from 2003 to 2012. And um, you'll see on the uh, chairs throughout the room the restatement study. Uh, we're going to walk through some of the highlights of the study. It's uh, really in depth, and I think when you get to get back to your offices and spend some time looking at it, you'll see there is a lot of data um, in here. And so we're going to do a deep dive on just some of the, the really interesting information that is contained in this study. And we were so pleased and uh, thrilled with the work that Susan did, uh, her independent research that we did commission. So uh, really a great commendation to Sue on the study because it, it's really fantastic. We do have some slides that we're going to tick through and you'll see that um, when, when we get to the slides, uh, the figure numbers on the graphs represent uh, those, correlate to those in the report. So if you're having trouble seeing the, the screen or you want to uh, dig a little deeper into it and follow along when we're talking, you can go to those figures. So um, as I said, we're going to have a discussion about what's behind the numbers in this restatement study. We do have, uh, in addition to Susan, three great practitioners, senior practitioners from the profession who is going to help us interpret some of that data and maybe uh, get behind why some of the numbers uh, reveal what they do reveal. So first, uh, at my immediate left, is Mike Gaynor from uh, KPMG. He's a partner in uh, the public accounting area, and he serves uh, as an audit partner on uh, CA Inc. Is that how you say it, or California no, it Inc? No, CA <laughs> Inc. Um, and so uh, he also spent two years as a professional accounting fellow in the office of the chief accountant at the SEC. We also have Steve Mizell, who is a partner at PwC. He's an assurance partner and is in their national professional services group. And Steve, uh, I don't know if this is a, a good thing about you or a bad thing about you, but uh, uh, you serve on our uh, research advisory board. It's certainly a good thing about you. I don't know if sometimes it's more of a burden <laughs> than a benefit. Um, I know it's a good thing. We appreciate that you do that. It's a lot of behind the scenes work. And of course, the research advisory board uh, is the organization or the group within the CAQ that's comprised of academics as well as senior professionals who help guide our research agenda. So we're very thankful for Steve for your service on that. And then last but not least from the profession, we have um, Chris Smith, who is a partner and board member at BDO USA. And um, he serves as the firm's professional practice leader for audit and accounting. Uh, we will have time for questions, but we'd like to get through the material, so I'll leave at least 15 minutes at the end of the session for your questions. So I would ask that you please hold those until we get to that portion of the, the session. But again, um, we're really thankful for uh, Sue's work. She's done a lot of great uh, work uh, in her career, and this is just the latest of the work that she's done out of the University of Kansas. So Sue, I am going to turn it over to you. All right, well, first of all, I'd like to, to thank the CAQ for the opportunity to do this study. It, it not only indulges my penchant for descriptive research, because I think that's an important starting point for, for more in-depth analysis, but uh, the chance to work with the Research Advisory Board has been invaluable. The insights that the partners, Steve is one who has spent hours with this report and really opened my mind to some nuances that I never appreciated just looking at the data from an academic viewpoint. And um, Margo Sella, with whom this report never would have come close to being published, she was with me when over 100 footnotes had to change by one number in the post-publication <laughs> process. And of course, my inspiration and mentors, Ivana Palmrose, with whom I would, who knows where I would be, but it would not be here if it were not for her. Anyway, enough about 
me and my thanks. Um, I think we're moving on to the first slide. We are. So we'll take a look here at the first slide, which is figure one. So if you want to look at it in your report, you can. And um, Susan, I think what we should start with is having you give us an overview of what we're seeing here on figure one and what these numbers represent. All right. So here, the first, the first takeaway here, I think, is just the decline in the absolute number of restatements over the, since, since the big years of 2005, 2006 right after Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted and as the first ICFR reports were being issued. You can see this dramatic decline in the absolute number of restatements. Another thing that was really brought home to me as I did this study and talked with the REB members is the distinction between what the report calls 402 restatements and non-402 restatements. Not a very elegant descriptor. They're also called big R's and little r's in the profession. Um, Reporting for the big R, little r distinction began in late 2004. So in this study, the, the breakout beginning in 2005. So the big R restatements, the 402 restatements, the restatements uh, reported on item um, Form 8K, um, that's an indication of severity. And as you can see, not only do the absolute number of restatements go down, but the number of big R restatements goes down even more dramatically. So. At the beginning of this reporting time, I think about 65% of all restatements were big R's. By the time we get to 2012, the percentage is down to the 30s. So not only a decrease in the absolute number of restatements, but a decrease in the number of 402 restatements. So Steve, um, can you give a little more uh, insight into the 402 restatements or the big R restatements versus the little R restatements and maybe uh, a few examples of that. I, I know that when uh, we first started talking about this, I struggled a little bit with that uh, vernacular and so um, if there are others in the audience such as myself, they're probably not, people are probably a little more uh, versed in this than I was, but just give us a little more flavor of the definition of those and what we're talking about, if you would. <laughs> it's. Uh if we should have just played back videos that had the uh, Zavana and, and, and Sue and Margo, myself and the others from the early days of talking about this because we found ourselves, okay, we just, before we go forward with all this information, because audit analytics does provide a lot of information and, and as soon as you indicated early on, it's let's get some appreciation for what's in and what's out. You know, because ultimately you decided in your report to go you know, 402 restatements and then non-402 restatements. And there's, other than in the first couple of pages, there's no further reference to big R or little r. And then, and then of course, you throw in, which we've heard on panels already and other discussions, well, then where do revisions fit in? You know, are they big R's or are they little r's? And so all of them, regardless of what you call the big ones, the small ones, the restatements, the revisions, the reissuances versus non-reissuances, they all have to do with errors in the financial statements that were previously issued. The distinction, the core around what you think about them, really runs to the materiality of the matter that's being evaluated or matters um, uh, that are being considered by management or by auditors and others. And in that one, and when you really look at the materiality of those issues, the materiality analysis is really from a couple of perspectives, from, from a quantitative one as well as a qualitative. And you need to consider all those facts and circumstances. And then underlying or, or, or around surrounding that entire matter, there's a lot of judgment that's exercised. Oftentimes we were asked, and you know, when, we, when Sue was going through a work, well, how do you draw it here? And we're looking at a very specific example. And, and, you know, and you'd come back to facts and circumstances, what's the quantitative, what's the qualitative, and you really have to be in the shoes of that management and or that auditor to truly understand it. In other words, you know, at some point, you're, you're limited as to what you can uh, analyze in those situations. Um, so I always underscore, regardless of, uh, as you look and as we go forward, just remember we're dealing with errors in financial statements that were previously issued. As to, um, so, so let me give you maybe just a, an example. So um, um, I'll, I'll just pretend for the moment I'm, I'm a company in which, you know, explaining one of my errors in which, you know, three years ago our largest segment 
um, we introduced a new uh, product line. And we discovered today, you know, in that product line that we didn't really it, uh, understand the underlying contracts and apply the right generally accepted accounting principles, you know, against those contracts, the new contracts for the new products and services that we were, uh, had introduced in this uh, segment of our business, our largest. After looking at that materiality analysis, both quantitative, qualitative, looking at all the factors, we realized that we had overstated our revenue. Not only the revenue was overstated, but as you work through the P&L, other line items to gross margin, all the way down to ultimately net income, that analysis company reached a determination that it was materially misstated for the last three years. And there again, I said that that was determined materially. In that particular situation, post uh, 402, the company in, in determination with its audit committee, having had a discussion with its independent auditors, issues a 402 AK, which Sue is reflected in the report as a 402 restatement that says that the financial statements um, should no longer be relied upon for those three years, and then the company should undertake to uh, put new financial statements, restated financial statements on, on file with the SEC. Example of a big R. A little R, I'm going to give a different example, but we could have, that same analysis could have been done and determined that it was a little R, but just to give a flavor of a different example, three years ago, our company uh, acquired a company, we put an intangible into the balance sheet as a result of that purchase accounting, and over the last three years we forgot to amortize that, to, that intangible dollar a year. Based on that same, going through the same process of looking at the quantitative and qualitative factors, the company determined that the prior financial statements uh, were not materially misstated looking at all of them, and yet they determined that taking that $3 charge in the current year based on the estimated earnings that the company was going to have for the current year, it would be material to make that total correction. In that particular case, and based on, and which we'll get into I think later, looking at, at new rules, particularly SAB 108, the company the next time revised its financial statements to reflect that in the prior year, which could not be absorbed in the current year. What we would call a revision, what you would call a little r, what the report reflects as a non-402 restatement. That's helpful. Um, and so it's, it's um, some of it's judgmental. You mentioned Saab. Uh, 108. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit of that, about that if we could. Now, Mike, um, I'm going to turn to you. So it, the SEC issued uh, SAB 108 in September of 2006, and I think the goal was to address the diversity and practice in quantifying financial statement misstatements and the potential under the then current practices for buildups of improper amounts on the balance sheet. So can you outline for us a little bit more about what SAB 108 did with respect to uh, determining if an identified error uh, should indeed result in a restatement? And um, we have some terminology there as well. Some of it is a little colorful. There are, I understand, iron curtain methods as well as all over <coughs> methods. So if you could give us a little uh, flavor as to that too, please. Sure. There's certainly no shortage of jargon in our profession. But generally what, what happens as you get near the issuance of your financial statements, the audit's done, management's books are closed, you sit down and you say, okay, how much error do we know about? Like what, what, what is not yet reflected in those financial statements? And there's any number of reasons. Maybe the auditor found it and management hasn't had time to correct it. Maybe it was, you know, they closed their books and as they're going through their close process, management on its own it identifies some error. And so, so prior to the issuance of those financial statements, you sit down and you say, okay, can I, can I issue these as they're drafted or do I need to correct this? And in practice, there was really two ways that people looked at those. One is, was a balance sheet centric analysis, which is what's referred to as the iron curtain method. And basically what that did was that said, all right, 
if I've got $3 million worth of error in my balance sheet, it can be any type of error. It could be an understated liability. It could be an overstated asset. Could I correct that in my income statement and still conclude that it was immaterial, right? And so it's, it's, it's can I fix all of the error in the balance sheet? And as long as the conclusion was, yes, I could, then um, you, you could go ahead and issue the, finan the financial statements. Under the iron, or under the, the another method is it was probably a little more common in practice. What's called the rollover method, and it was a very much a P&L centric way to look at misstatements, which is how much error is in my income statement. And errors can either have arisen in the current period, right? Like it's an error that we made on this year's sales, um, and and could be corrected because you've not yet issued these year's financial statements. But what you would do is you would say, all right, well, let me evaluate that with the effect of errors that maybe existed last year that reversed this year. So maybe last year I took some sales a little early and therefore I actually have an understatement in this year's income statement, but I, I took a little some sales a little early this year too, and so that's offset. And so you kind of get into this, this sort of netting approach. And, and basically what SAB 108 did was it said, you, you gotta pass both tests. And in practice what that did, there was a lot of sort of effect of adoptions related to SAB 108. And as Cindy alluded to, there was a lot of error that had accumulated in people's balance sheets that was not being corrected because they were taking a P&L centric analysis. Um, and so as long as they left it up on the balance sheet and their P&L was okay, they said, okay, fine, I'll issue those financial statements. What SAB 108 did was it said, you gotta pass both tests. And so a lot of people had to correct uh, errors that had accumulated in, in the financial statements, those generally got booked as a, a, a change in accounting principle and aren't included in the restatement data. Um, but, but I think you have seen an increase in the what are referred to as non-402s in the study and as Steve referred to as little r's. I, I think you see an increase of those is because a lot of times what happens is people don't realize error is building up and it's building up in small amounts over a series of years and then all of a sudden you find it. and and to fix it, right, you can't fix it in one year, right? So let's say it's accumulated to 10 million, I can't fix 10 in one year. But if I were to go back and change all of the years that have been impacted, it's not material to any of those years. And so, so there, were, there was a sort of a trend in practice to say, all right, well, we'll just do a little r. And the next time we publish the financial statements, we'll alert all the investors that, hey, look, you know, by the way, those numbers don't agree to what you've seen previously because we made these immaterial adjustments. And so, so the big change with SAB 108 was to just force everybody on the dual method with the goal of keeping corporate America's books cleaner. Um, and then a knock-on effect of that was that we got into a situation where there was you know, when you found it, when you found these errors that you couldn't fix in, in one fail swoop, you, people were doing little R's uh, t to get those corrected. So, Chris, listening to this discussion, it, it still uh, seems that there's a lot of judgment in the process. And so, if you could maybe spend a few minutes and talk about uh, what processes the either the preparer. Um, and the auditor as well use when going through these analyses. Yeah, absolutely. But before I do that, just a couple housekeeping items. First, an observation. Even in a group as robust and august as this, the tendency to fill the room from the back never ceases to amaze me. So what, what is it with us accountants? I just, I'm up here pondering that. Secondly, I, I should clarify, hopefully I was asked to be on this panel just given my experience in helping resolve these issues as opposed to generating these issues. So I just want to <laughs> clarify that. And my views tend to be mostly informed on hypothetical situations or hearsay of what I hear goes on at other firms. So. Uh, <laughs> are you going to also say that your views are your views Yeah, only, my views only, views yes, yes. Panel, and, 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 everybody else yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you know what's interesting, uh, to maybe to pick up on a point that both Steve and Mike said, you know, there's, there's no one answer in these things, and, and it is so fact-dependent, it, it's kind of like answering the question, how long is a piece of string? Well, show me the string, and I'll tell you how long it is. What, what do you do when you come across these things? And I, I think what has happened over the last 10 years is there's been introduced into the uh, process a certain discipline that, that both the, the accountant and the auditor have to go through. And I, the, the question, as Cindy posted, I, I think is telling in that w when there is an error, it, it, 
no longer is just in the, the purview or, or domain of the auditor to figure out whether or not it's material. It starts with the, the company, and there's judgment that has to be applied there, and then the auditor has to agree or disagree with the, the judgment. The, what SAB 108 really did for both, both sides is to actually put that discipline in. So it's, you come up with the error first, there's the way to look at it and, and accumulate them, and then we go back to SAB 99, which kind of informs us as to how to assess it. And I, having gone through this several times, um, I, I come at it from two different categories. First, I try and get my, my head around what's the cause. So in, in determining if, if it's material or not, I want to ask, well, why, why did that happen? What, what's the underlying reason? Is there intention? Was it a true error? Was it precise? Was it not precise? And then I get into the importance of the, the error, and the importance as far as, well, what does it impact? And it used to be maybe we would just look at what was the impact on EPS, but I, I think through some of the, the guidance from uh, the SEC and others have told us that there's a whole host of other qualitative things that we have to think about. And it's, you know, impact on trends, impact on flipping something from income to a loss, does it do anything with compliance with any sort of um, uh, document? So it, it's, um, you know, as I have come to see it, and people in my shop always tell me that I always tie everything back to an episode of Star Trek, but I, there was an episode where Spock was playing three-dimensional chess, and I, I just kind of always say, well, I have to look at the quantitative, the qualitative, and then there's a, a huge psychological thing, both with the engagement team and with the, the company trying, trying to work through that. So there, there's a lot of judgment that, and, and thought that goes into this. Okay, so if this slide shows us the number of restatements, uh, the top graph, which is figure four, if you want to look at it in your uh, document, talks about the severity of restatements. And so, Sue, if you could maybe uh, talk a little bit about the different metrics you use to classify severity and the trends that we've seen with respect to severity over the study period, please. So the, the first the first severity trend I pointed out was the, dec the decrease in the number and the percentage of the 402 restatements, but that is that is reflected in several other metrics. So one that I looked at was how pervasive are the errors across the financial statements. So the top graph breaks out restatements into how many issues were identified by in the restatement. Was it just revenue? Was it revenue and 10 other different accounting issues? It's, this is a hard, this is, this is based on the audit analytics breakout, which is kind of hard to get your arms around because they don't just list the number of, or just list the income or balance sheet accounts, but um, this is a, an estimate of how many accounting issues were involved in restatements over the years. So if you look at the blue line, the one that trends up, that is the number of restatements that involve only one accounting issue. So you can see that early in the decade, Relatively few, about half, only had one accounting issue. By the time we get to 2012, we have, like, what is it? I should remember this number. It's um, above 70 percent involved just one accounting issue, which suggests that the restatements or the errors when they occur are much less pervasive. Um, the second chart is looking at what part of the financial statements are affected. So usually, investors care most about core earnings, revenue, and ongoing operating expenses. And those two are captured in the bottom two color blocks. So the blue and the red together are core earnings, restatements that affect core earnings in some way. And you can see that that is trending down over time. By the time we get to the end of the decade, um, it's down around 40% of all restatements affect core earnings compared to over 60% at the beginning of the decade. And perhaps most importantly, because you know, prior studies indicate that revenue is a really big driver of investor reaction, that has gone down even from 20% to about 10% over the decade. 
So both of these are consistent with the notion that along with the decrease in the number of restatements, the overall severity of restatements has declined as well. So let's focus first on the top graph if we can when I turn now to the uh, practitioners to talk a little bit about uh, what are some of the other uh, financial reporting and market developments that might have had an impact on the number and type of restatements. We've already talked about uh, SAB 108, but are there other uh, issues that have happened or have occurred over the past uh, several years that might explain some of this uh, the, this decrease in those, those core issues that investors seem to care the most about? And I'll open it up to I all see. three of you. Well, I mean, I'm going to give kudos first to Sue because also, you know, since you have the, her study, if you open up just to the cover, I think she does a great job and it's also in a, what, Appendix A in a more detailed fashion. But, you know, when you look at, you know, what's happened and how restatements and the number of issues, well, you have to look at what was the environment, where, what standards were going on, what issues were happening that were uh, hot button items or came to light um, during those periods of time. And, and, you know, some of these are enumerated here, which, which I think tells a lot when you go back and you look to the first slide or to this slide and you look at the numbers and the period and recognize that the restatement period doesn't necessarily reflect that that year's financials per se were restated because it could be the catch up of things that happened three years ago, four years ago, you know, as we saw in the 2006 period on stock option backdating, for example, that reflect corrections of errors that went back 10 or more years. But the number is reflected in that peak year in 2006. So I think, I think as a starting point, I think I always try and think about, you know, when, I, when, I, when somebody shows me a graph that says, geez, there were a lot of revenue or a lot of particular issue, I try and think about what was the standard that was in place then, what was the economic environment, you know, obviously smaller P&Ls mean that the, the discussion that Chris had with us a moment ago when you thought about that materiality, it has an impact with smaller numbers. The magnitude, the quantitative, it becomes more challenging. Um, and then even I would go so far as to say, you know, how um, items are perceived uh, even by regulators. You know, what's the tone that's being expressed is how one is looking at items. I think we, we had one that's reflected on this page you know, around, you know, the leasing event going back that, you know, some would say today all those, and, and Mike, you could probably speak to it better, you know, didn't need to be restated back then. And some would say SAB 108 in part was a change by the SEC in reaction to those that were big R restatements back then. But today, many of them, I think we would agree, would probably be little R's. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I, I do think that there are contextual things that, that apply period to period in the analysis that, that are useful and, and particularly in the first few years after, you know, like 2005, 2006 and things I think began to normalize a bit in 2007. Um, but, you know, Steve mentioned things like stock option backdating. Those, those investigations were hot and heavy and I think that those show up in, a, in an industry um, slide in a, in a little bit. We'll talk more about them there. Um, you know, there was a lot of derivative restatements, you know, der, you, know, the, you know, the golden rules related to derivatives is one, don't enter into derivatives, number two, if you do, don't, you know, apply hedge accounting, um, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, there was a lot of companies that, that ended up restating over um, those things. And, and, and I, I think also contextual in, in the analysis is when people went through and, and, and mapped out their processes, you know, that was a lot of home remodeling. There, you, you, you go in and you figure, you know, okay, I just need to put a paint job on it. Well, when you get in there start painting, you know, I actually maybe need to replace the sheetrock. You pull the sheetrock off, you figure out, oh, wow, you know, these pops are, pipes are kind of rotted too. Um, you know, and we figured out that, you know, we've not done this right over the past eight years. And, and so, so there was a lot of um, reasons why that period in the 05 to, to 07 range were, was, was tumultuous. Um, and, and, you know, but I, but I do think where the data is beginning to trend um, in, in the out years in the study is really reflective of um, a lot of those improvements and a lot of the, the sort of improvements in the financial reporting dynamic. Yeah, I, I would just add, it's that I tend to see more focus and it's 
focus from the, the auditors and the company about wanting to get things right. Uh, Mike mentioned that you know, 10 years ago there was a little bit of a buildup on, on balance sheets and had to work through that, but I, I, what I have seen is people learn. So we don't want to go back to those times that people uh, on both sides of the fence, companies, audit committees, auditors, we're all a little bit more careful in our approach when we when we find something going on or the potential for something to go on. And I think that's adding to this. Um, the other item that I, I think maybe in the, the more, more recent years has been a little bit quiet from new accounting standards. So I, I think companies went, went through a period of time where they had to digest a bunch. It's last year or two, I, I think it's been a little bit on the, the quiet side. You know, it remains to be seen what happens once the new revenue standard kicks in and, and maybe some of the other guidance that's due out from the FASB in the next year or two, maybe, maybe these stats are going to change slightly. Yeah. I, I'd just add that, you know, just in particular, going to that, you find that, that steep increase on just the one item. And, and for all the factors we've talked about, and, you know, post Sarbanes-Oxley, there was a lot of sheetrock. And, yep. and SAB 108 also facilitated, let's get this cleaned up. And that involved the two, the three, when you had restatements, the two, the three, the four items. Today, most, most times when issues are being um, you know, brought to the auditors, it's this item, we have a problem. And it's the single item, which in so many ways, when you think about, therefore, while a lot of judgment, a lot of time is put into it, um, one, you know, I'm, I'm glad when evaluating it, I'm looking at one item versus two, three, and four because the magnet, because then when you go back to what you talked about, Chris, that SAB 99, looking at the quantitative and qualitative, you know, you can laser focus as opposed to there's so much stuff here. I think we've got to remodel the entire house. Right. And I, I was going to say, I, I even think seven or eight years ago when that, that first item got brought up, we, we all started asking, are, are we sure that's all there is? Let's not just look at this w one item. Are there any other items kind of like that that could also be, be lurking? So I think that may have picked up some of the, these other items now. And yeah, it just but lately our, our practice has been that the one-offs tend to be the one-off transactions where accounting unfortunately is still kind of complex and it, it doesn't seem to have that uh, spillover effect into other financial statement areas. So we're going to move on here to the next slide, but two quick points that before we do so, I, I want to point out that we don't have a slide for it and we won't really talk about it, but um, in the, the paper, I think you'll find that restatement periods are shorter, mm -hmm. which is, I think, another good sign, another optimistic sign. And um, uh, then you mentioned, uh, Chris, the revenue uh, standards that are going to come out at FASB soon. One of the things that's so important, I think, about having this body of work that Sue has produced is that it will give us a baseline. And so as time goes on and as new issues arise, we'll be able to compare and see how things have changed um, in reaction to some of these things. So it, it seems like things have normalized now, and um, it'll be nice to have that to be able to go back to. So I, I think more to come on that. Uh, yeah, and I, I'd just add, I, I do think the FASB gave everyone a, um, a, a break by, by putting the standard out, that standard out now, giving us a couple of years to, to work through it and make sure we understand it before it ever first becomes applicable. So hopefully that isn't going to pull back on uh, corporate reporting. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, which is figure nine. And this talks about the effect of restatement on previously reported income. And to me, this is a really important slide because uh, I think that we all know that investors really value restatements as an indicator of uh, what's going on and as of audit quality. Now, of course, at the CAQ, uh, working with the profession and, and other stakeholders, we've developed an approach to audit quality indicators, but this is a big indicator for investors currently, and that is uh, restatements. And so I think part of that is because 
uh, sometimes you would see a decrease in reported income. But Sue, why don't you talk to us a little bit uh, about this slide and then we'll get into some of the trends that we're seeing represented on this slide. All right, so again, another indicator of declining severity in this slide. First of all, I should say that those of you who have worked with AA data know that they only collect the effect on income for a subset of all restatements, usually restatements that were um, for, by companies trading on major exchanges. So we're down to less than half of the total restatements when we're looking at this slide. But these are the big companies and arguably the ones that have the most effect on the market. And you can see that there is a decline, again, in the number or the percentage of the restatements that have reduced previously reported income. And there is a corresponding increase in the percentage of restatements that have no effect on income. So for example, misclassifications, uh, cash flow statements, disclosure issues, those have been growing as a percentage while the percent that negatively affect income have been declining. The line across the middle represents 402 restatements, the percentage of 402 restatements that reduce income. So as you would expect, since 402 restatements typically are judged to be more material to, in to investors, I assume that's your basis for your judgmental assessment, um, they tend to be more likely to reduce previously reported income. But that's declining as well. So um, looking to the practitioners on the panel, if we focus in on the blue bars there at the bottom of the chart, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what this might tell us about restatements when you see that approximately 40 percent decrease income uh, versus the higher percentages for the 402 restatements, which are the, um, uh, the, the bar there that we see. I think um, it, it's been touched on a couple times, and the, you know, a big distinction between a 402 and a non-402 <laughs> is people's perceptions of liability for not having advised investors that the numbers are, are being revised, right? So you, you go the 402 path when you decide that, hey, this is information that I need to get out there promptly, not information that I can sit on until the next time I issue a set of financial statements. And so, I, you know, it's natural to expect that when you have to go to investors and tell them things aren't quite as rosy as you told them, you know, last time you gave them a set of financial statements, people are naturally more sensitive to that and they naturally will gravitate towards an item 402 restatement. So I think, I think that's one dynamic, is that when you're telling investors that it's not quite as good as they thought, people generally want to make sure they get that out there quickly so they can avoid getting sued. Um, but, but secondly, I think with respect to the shift in, you know, increases and decreases, I think part of what it shows is that, um, you know, bad news sometimes doesn't travel well, you know, in companies. And so, so if things that cause you to reduce net income, I think, are don't always surface as, you know, as quickly. Um, you know, if there's bad news, sometimes it gets hung up in the control systems, like, oh, well, that's not my resp responsibility to report it up. And so, I, so I do think you see some human behavior sort of manifesting itself in, in, in the way some of this restatement data shakes out. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I just think the sensitivity to the P&L, it's always there, at, particularly, you know, at a, at a 402. I, I come back so much to there's guidance on how to look at it quantitatively, but then you got to go back to that SAB 99 and look at all the facts and circumstances. And when it's in that P&L, particularly when when the, to your point, Mike, when you, a company has gone out to the street in its press release and here's what we did, here's what we made, you know, and, and we come back time and time again, how important is this to you? What was your, you know, projections versus what you said? How sensitive was it? And uh, it, that p and that, that, uh, that evaluation, um, very difficult. And so you see that sensitivity reflected in that bar that says it's higher in that 402. Well, I'll admit, I, I've started the slide repeatedly. I'm still not sure what it's saying. But <laughs> that said, that doesn't stop me from having an opinion on it. I, <laughs> what's kind of buried in there that, that did speak to me is the, the fact that restatements now actually are out there that don't impact um, income. And I, I do think that there was this tendency to uh, 
just think in terms of restatements or errors impacting earnings. And I, I personally saw a shift in mindset with the issuance of, uh, I, I trace it back to AS6, where PCOB put something out six, seven years ago, I forget how long ago it was, but it said to the auditors, hey, consistency uh, means a couple different things, including classifications. And I, I think that prior to that, there was a lot of comfort taken in the fact that if a company was shifting things around on a balance sheet or cash flow statement, that, hey, that was covered by that benign uh, clause that all companies have in their financial statements that says, hey, prior year amounts may have been reclassified to conform to current year presentation. And I think now when we see that, we call time out and say, let's think in terms of whether that really is an error or a classification because there are certain lines on, on the balance sheet and uh, cash flow statement that actually mean something, mean something more. So I think that is something that was coming out of that trend is that, yeah, er errors don't just impact the P&L. And I, I think that's now the mindset on the auditor. I think that's actually the mindset of corporate America now that we, we've worked through that on several reporting cycles. Well, well, plus I think we found from a control standpoint, the more companies got into that financial reporting close process and they looked at you know, the cash flow statement in particular, they for the first time be began to see, you know, well, who's doing it? What are they doing? And that it's more than a mathematical exercise of comparing year over year amounts. And I think that's taken a, a number right. of years to sort of flush through. So there again, you go back to some of the benefits maybe out of Sarbanes-Oxley, clearly, you know, looking at the process, the entire closed process, and they've challenged us as auditors. What are you doing in the closed pr process? You know, and where's your, you know, evidence that would suggest that their closed process right. is both designed properly and it's operating effectively? And, and I think some of that also brought to light cash flow statement and other classification errors as opposed to reclassified because of acceptable alternatives. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, just coming on that, I, I just have found over the last 10 years the, the importance of the cash flow statement, especially that cash flow from operations, it's just kind of launched itself to, to become one of the more critical numbers in assessing corporate performance. So. I think there is a lot more focus around what, what is above and below that line in the construct of that statement. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, which is figure 11. Um, I find this a fascinating slide, and so uh, we'll spend some time talking about this, but this is looking at the characteristics of companies that file restatements. And so, Sue, the pie chart, chart shows us uh, industry patterns for restatement companies. And as you can see, hopefully, that the two biggest slices of the pie are computer and software um, at 18% and financial banking and insurance at 16%. So um, even though the title of the slide kind of gives it away, uh, <laughs> did, did, did you find that these proportions held throughout the 10-year study period? It, they did held across the 10-year study period. Um, in fact, when we started this project, one of the, the big questions that the study was supposed to address were changes in industry across the period. And by the time I finished the analysis, I was asking if they wanted to take that section out because there just really aren't very many changes across industries in the, this time period other than a few blips for um, some specific accounting issues. I mean, I think um, computer and software is number one every year except for when it's number two or number three. You know, there it's, it's remarkably, remarkably consistent. So if you take those two together, um, that's 35%. And then if you add in the next biggest tranche, which is um, energy, mining, and chemical industries, you get almost 49% uh, or almost half of the restatements tend to be in those three industries. And so I'm, I'm curious from the panel, the practitioners in particular, you know, what are the underlying issues that might drive uh, the need in these industries to restate more often than the others? You know, I can start by speaking to the technology industry because I do spend a fair amount of time in that space. Um, when, one of the things I think that's driving the data um, 
although it, it, the fact that I guess it applies every year, it, it takes away from this a little bit, but the stock option backdating um, issues that existed were particularly pervasive in the technology sector. Um, that's where the incentives for doing that were the greatest, and that's where the you know, majority of, I mean, it's not surprising that those are the, you know, that's the industry where we, we saw that most prevalently. Uh, but within technology generally, I think there's a couple of other things that cause the statistics to stand out every year. One is that revenue recognition is very complicated in that industry. For those of you who are familiar, it's the specialized literature in SOP 97.2. Um, has a lot of anti-abuse provisions in it, um, very easy to get it wrong. Uh, so you have, you have complicated gap. Uh, a lot of these companies are emerging companies that um, you know, maybe don't have the, the, the same sort of steady financial processes that you know, larger, more established uh, companies have. And so, so those two factors alone, um, I think, just cause it to be more apt to result in, in restatements. And, but that same complexity notion spills over into other you know, parts of their business as well. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, a lot of times technology companies are, you know, the amount of employee comp that is equity-based is really high. A lot of times they'll have special puts and calls and all sorts of things that um, if you don't have a seasoned, um, you know, financial reporting staff in, in your company, and you might not because you might decide as an emerging technology business that it makes a lot more sense to spend money on a guy who can raise VC funds than spend money on a guy who, who can quote chapter and verse of, of the various accounting standards. And so you you run into situations where there's a little bit of a mismatch and that increases the likelihood that errors um, come ripping through. And, and Mike, I would add that you were very kind to all of us when you say, for example, software, it's 97.2 or one particular because whenever I look at a memo around a problem, and you probably do too if you, if you stick just with software, it starts with 97.2 and it ends with some e emerging issues task force issue and there's <clears throat> about 10 other sightings of professional literature that were considered on the matter. And likewise, you know, in stock options, particularly during the, um, the, the backdating when you were looking across an entire, you know, range of years and what was the accounting literature applied and, and the nuances of it, there was never a single, a single standard, a single EITF, a single SOP, a single SEC piece of literature, you were looking at all of it and it just, it, it demonstrates, you know, how, how difficult and challenging it is to get it right all the time and the resources that are required. I think to me, it, it's, uh, you know, the pie chart itself, yeah, it may be consistent, but uh, it does demonstrate that complexity exists out there today, even though we've had a relatively quiet period and therefore, some of the tail end, you know, that we see from 2006 to now is not just, um, you know, socks, but it's also we've been relatively quiet on that standards front, which enables us to sort of play us, meaning the entire, you know, both profession as well as pre uh, preparers to catch up, to make sure it's being applied right every, every day, you know, and um, difficult. You, you guys said it all, all, I would add, when I look at this chart, it just tells me if I have a client that specializes in financing software companies, I need to be on high alert. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before we move on, I would just point out that uh, th this topic is discussed uh, very uh, fulsomely in chapter three of the uh, report. So uh, there's, there's some additional charts in there that give a little more flavor. So uh, if you're interested in this, I would uh, highlight that for you uh, to go to chapter three. So now moving on to our next chart, which is figure 16. Um, Sue, talk to us. You looked at average assets of restatement companies with that of companies that had the data in the um, CompuStat database. Talk to us a little bit about what you found and then maybe a little bit um, about the limitations, if you will, on the CompuStat data. So most of you are probably in this audience familiar with CompuStat and um, the companies they follow, which tend, tend to be, um, well, public companies. It's not entirely clear what their criteria is for inclusion um, once you get beyond the major exchanges. or um, But as, as a comparison set, um, 
just to get a sense of whether the restatement companies <coughs> tend to be bigger, smaller, tracking what's going on with the relative size. Uh, again, only for the restatement companies with available asset data because not all asset data is available either from CompuStat or from Audit Analytics. So we're looking at around 6,500 restatements here. And um, so you can see that in the beginning years of the decade up through the 2006 period that they were about the same as the average CompuStat. The average restatement company total assets was about the si same as the average CompuStat company's total assets. And then they start to drop. So from 2007 on, we have relatively smaller restatement companies compared to CompuStat companies. Um, 2012, you see a big jump in the average assets of restatement companies, and that is because of restatements announced by some very large financial institutions. So as you all know, the assets of banks are different than the assets of most companies, so when you're throwing an average in there, it ends up being significantly, uh, have a really, having a very big impact. If you look at the medians, they are also, also jump in 2012, although not so much. So, uh, what is the, the practitioners, what do you all make of the fact that the, it tends to be the smaller companies that are restating their financials? Um, uh, we at the CAQ certainly have a point of view about that, but uh, I'm curious uh, what you make of that. Well, you know, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, I, and, and coincidentally, I just had a discussion with some, some colleagues about this, and um, it, it, was, it really wasn't sort of small company, big company, but it was, it was accelerated filer that does full 404 versus it was a relatively large company that didn't do, um, it didn't do that. But, you know, I, and it, like the day before I had the conversation, I had watched this TV program that some of you may have heard about called Comedians in Cars, right? It's this new Jerry Seinfeld internet-based thing, and the premise of the show is he goes and he gets another comedian, and they get into a car, and they go to a diner and have coffee and tell jokes, and they've done like Chris Rock and, and um, you know, Sarah Jessica Parker and, and any number of other people. and and. It, you know, one of the, the pretenses of the show is, is this car that they go in is generally like an older car. Like they did John Stewart and it was this gremlin from, you know, 72 or whatever. And they did Sarah Jessica Parker in this like LTD station wagon with the wood trim, you know, like I had when I was a kid. But one of the things that struck me about that show was, and so they have the cars all equipped with, with cameras, right, so that you can see them sitting in the car talking to each other. And when they sat down in the car, they reached over and they clicked the lap belt. And, and it, it struck me, it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, that's not safe. You know, they're driving around out on these roads and all they have is that lap belt, right? And, and then like a couple of days later, I, I used that example to explain to somebody what it's like to audit a company and deal with financial reporting in a full 404 filer versus somebody who is not. Right? The companies that are not, they're, they're basically driving around with a lap belt, right? And as an audit professional, as an investor, I think everybody actually wants to have a shoulder harness, maybe a couple of airbags, and, and I think that's really the difference. And, and I think our sensibilities are changing. Um, and I, I don't think we'll find lap belts you know, quite as acceptable you know, going forward um, as we used to. And I, I think over time, the data is going to out, bear out very well that small doesn't necessarily mean less complex. Um, less complex doesn't necessarily mean small. Uh, and, and I think we're going to begin to have as a system, you know, it's going to be harder for companies to, to sort of <coughs> even get a financial statement only audit done without rigorous and quality internal controls because w as a system, we're beginning to expect lap belts and airbags, and when we show up and all they've got, or excuse me, shoulder harnesses and airbags, when we show up and all they have is a lap belt, it, it's gonna be a pretty difficult endeavor for both the auditor and the issuer. And I, I just think times are changing and, and hopefully the, the politicians don't involve themselves needlessly in something they know a little about, but um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Steve is urging me to shake up the order, so I will. All right, yeah. so, yeah. Um, you know, it, I am, I would just. Plus, you're not wearing a seatbelt. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
hopefully that was Sarah Silverman, not Sarah Jessica Parker. But anyway, um, I, I would resist the temptation to draw conclusions off this. I, I Actually, of all the slides here, I, I thought this was the jumping off point to say, well, is this really a causal relationship here? Because I might have compared restatements to other things other than asset size. I might look to um, market cap, I might look to revenues, I might look to bottom line earnings, and I, and I think there were some of those in there. But um, to Mike's point, I, small, it, it could mean a lot of things. I, my experience has been is that smaller companies tend, in this generality, it's internal resources may factor into this, and um, financing options, and I just, it, in my walk of life, I just find where we, we tend to see small companies very much more active than larger companies are in complex financing. So they can't go get more traditional sources of financing, which don't, you know, traditional sources, excuse me, sources of financing are pretty straightforward from an accounting standpoint, but the more exotic you get, the, the more likely it is that the accounting's gonna be tough and get to tough accounting issues and you know errors just come along so this is one of those slides where I was going I, there there's a lot of directions you you could go from what this slide is saying um, and just have that top side comment well it, it, in fact sue we, you may want to also comment because when we were when we saw this information originally from the report we were asking you lots of questions you know as a research advisory board regarding <laughs> Well, wait a minute, is that year include a XYZ restatement because they're a, a large financial institution and the numbers alone, and you said, oh yes, that does include, you know, when you went back. Likewise, we saw both on large and small the dynamics that, for example, like the foreign. And I don't know if we really touched on, but we ought to talk a little bit about, you know, the fact that we asked you to sort of look at this report and see if we could make any distinctions, which we've never, which had not been done in your prior report to try and cover you know, the foreign, to see if there's any things that would maybe tell us whether on asset size, yeah. re, 402 ver, uh, restatements versus non-402, et cetera. Well, I, I will say that revenues, if you look at revenues, it follows the same pattern. It does. Um, and I didn't put that table in. We had lots of tables, but it is noted. Um, also, the, the foreign runs throughout the report, and I don't think it, we're talking about it much here, but with the foreign companies, if you look at their size, there tends to be two clumps, very large, very large international companies, many of them financial institutions. Um, on average, the size of foreign com restatement companies is larger than domestic restatement companies. But if you look at the medians, it flips. So the median foreign company is smaller than the median US restatement company, which suggests to me that we have a group of very large multinational firms, and then we have a group of very small, very, very small firms that are restating, and, and not a lot in the middle. I mean, if, if this is reflected if when there's an analysis that looks at exchange membership as well. They tend to be on the New York Stock Exchange or um, on the bulletin boards on the OTC, but there aren't many on the NASDAQ. So it seems that the foreign companies are they're, they're a distinct group, and um, this study doesn't go into a lot of depth on that. I think that's a good place for research. Well, and didn't your research also look at companies' profitability in, in restatements? And yeah, what? yes, there is some, some looking. The, the problem with profitability is that um, it is much, that data is hard, hard to get. So, um, so it is a much smaller sample. Is, but it does show, as, as prior studies have shown over time, that less profitable companies are more likely to restate. Yeah, for probably, again, a lot of different reasons that we could probably surmise, but I, again, it's something to watch, right? So once a company gets into that cycle, errors are, are I think, are more likely to, to exist. Well, so from a policy perspective, um, the CAQ has as an underlying principle that investors of all size, in all sizes of 
public companies should be entitled to the same uh, protections, the same reporting, the same information. And so um, we have always uh, resisted or opposed Congress's um, efforts to expand the companies that are exempt from reporting on the effectiveness of their internal controls. And certainly, uh, while not dispositive, we, we, we view this kind of data as supporting that notion that perhaps the companies that uh, could benefit from uh, internal controls and, and the 404 protections uh, should not be carved out. So we were pleased to see that now we have some data that can back up uh, our underlying principle. So moving on now to uh, figure 21 on our next slide. Um, Susan, talk to us a little bit about uh, this slide that shows the average and median market reactions to restatement announcements. Uh, and the various uh, indicators of severity. So this is a standard CAR, cumulative average return over a two-day window using an equally weighted uh, market adjustment. And again, this I, the, the biggest difference over time um, is that in the prior study, the, the Treasury study, or in, in studies of restatements that were done kind of around the turn of the century, the average market reaction was around negative 10%. Over this period of time, we see average market reactions that are only around you know, minus 1.5%. So on average, the market does not respond very strongly to a restatement announcement. As you would expect, when they're more serious, for example, 402 restatements tend to have more negative market reactions. They are more than uh, ne more than 2%, but still nowhere near the numbers or the magnitudes that obtained earlier in earlier years. Fraud is the biggest driver of a negative market reaction, followed by revenue restatements, and then the operating expenses. So again, revenue and operating expenses comprising that core earnings concept. And then once you get to um, other types of accounting issues, you have you know, smaller than average market reactions. So uh, the rest of the panel, any comment on the market reactions that you see here? Surprises, makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off. And I, I don't know that it's surprising. It just somewhat confirms as I, I look at it, revenue is still a critical number. So it's like the magic number that investors are, are focused on. So it's not surprising there. The, the thing with fraud, T to me, that's the not surprising. It, I, it does introduce the element of an unknown to, to people outside of, well, inside and outside of the circle of the, of the company. What what is going on? So I I can see where there's big uncertainty when that that uh, gets announced. I, as I look at, the, I personally look at the other categories. Somewhat suggests that. You know that, that restatements are, are somewhat factored in be, because we've gone through this period that there has been a little bit of de desensitizing to it. They don't have quite the same stigma that maybe they had 10 or 15 years ago. Um, that's kind of what I see when I, I see this particular graph. Yeah, maybe said a little differently. I, I view it. Users are digesting, yeah. you know, the the restatements whether. 402 or non 402, and but I think, in part, uh, I think that's also tied to the quality of the disclosures that companies are making. When they have errors and they're transparent about it, I think it serves all users in, in a positive way, and and you know, in staying outside of you know that whether you use the word fraud or usually intentional, and I, I that always raises you know the red flag and of course re revenue is still sensitive but I think by and large that users are digesting these uh, restatements and, and the only thing that I would add is I mean I and I think there are terms in academia for this but I, I think you know there's information in financial statements that's affirming and then there's information in financial statements that's maybe predictive and there's a lot of restatements that don't really hit numbers that are central to some analyst's expectation for future cash flows, right? And, and so, so, so I think that's you know, part of how the world reacts to restatements. And I think there's a lot of restatements that don't involve predictive measures. 
in part because GAP is so complicated. Um, but, but I also think that, you know, and I think this really, um, the, the, the fraud-centric reactions underscore this. There, it, it, to some extent, it, it tells, it, it calls into question the, the trustworthiness of the management team, right? I mean, when people make, put buy recommendations on a company, I mean, that is in part a, a, a statement of, of belief of the competence and the quality of the management team at a particular company. And when you're restating your numbers and you're restating for things that, you know, like, oh, I goofed up my, my you know, hedge accounting, right? Like, like, that doesn't always call into question, um, you know, the integrity of the management team. But if you're turning around revenue, right, people, you know, I, I sort of like, it, it's like the difference between, you know, going to a restaurant and getting a salad with a fly in it, right? You don't like it, right? But you might go back to the restaurant. But if you went to the restaurant and you ate the food and it made you throw up, right, you're not going to go back to the restaurant. And, and to me, that, that's sort of what investors do when they process through some of these things. It's really, you know what, these guys are just, you know, they're not worth my time and energy because I can't trust that they're going to do the right thing. Um, and, and that's where I think, you know, the ICFR regime, you know, it, it, I think the data shows that it does engender benefits in, in the reliability of the financial reporting that they put out. And so there's less, um, you know, chance that the management team sort of undermines their own, um, you know, integrity by, by putting bad data out there. So we've got seat belts and flies in our salad. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make it less abstract. <laughs> I like that. So um, let's go on then to uh, this next slide, which is uh, figure 24. Uh, this is in chapter five of the uh, paper uh, that Sue's put out. And um, as we know, uh, that the PCOB inspections uh, recently have focused on audits of internal control over financial reporting. And so yesterday, uh, we had the CAQ symposium when we brought together uh, top leaders from the profession with top researchers, and um, we had some ad students there as well. And uh, we had a panel on ICFR. And uh, I would note, for those of you who were not there yesterday, we did tape that session. Uh, as well as the discussion on audit quality indicators. And so uh, we will put that on our website. So you'll be able to see uh, those discussions uh, that should be up, we're hoping, by the end of the month. So look for that if you're interested in that. But uh, what we found as we, I think, Sue, since you went, when you went through this research and, and collected this uh, information and certainly the discussion that we had yesterday is that we came to the conclusion that there's not much known uh, about the relationship between restatements and ICFR uh, material weakness reports. And so um, looking at the audit analytic data, uh, you know, there are numbers in there. There were uh, 33,352 ICFR reports filed for large accelerated filers between 2005 and 2012. And of those 33 plus thousand, 92 percent reported effective ICFR. And those with an effective ICFR, only 2 percent uh, subsequently announced an annual uh, 402 restatement. And so, um, Sue, your analysis started with restatements and then looked to see what the ICFR report indicated in the period, both um, pr the prior period as well as the period after the restatement. And so if you could tell us a little bit about what you found or maybe what you didn't find. All right. So first of all, let me discuss the red bars here. Those are non-restatement companies. And this is telling us how many of the non-restatement companies reported a weakness in their ICFR in any given year. So you can see that the percentage among non-restatement companies in, say, 2012 is only 4 percent. So of all the companies that did not report a restatement, about 4 percent said that they did have a weakness in their internal controls. Then the blue bar is looking at companies that are restatement companies and looking at whether or not the report issued prior to their restatement announcement indicated weak internal controls. So you can see that they are dramatically higher. Restatement companies, on average, t about 22 percent of them report weak internal controls before the restatement is announced relative to 
uh, this average, I don't know what the overall average is off the top of my head, but you know, three, four percent by the end of the decade. So dramatically higher for the restatement companies. Um, I should note that this is a very high level analysis. There was no attempt to connect the restatement issue with the internal control report, um, the internal control weakness. Um, it's just a very initial look at how these two things connect, and there is a lot of additional work to do here. Also, I should also say that this is filtered down quite a bit. At this point, we're looking only at restatement companies that were 402 restatements and that had annual restatements that affected annual results because, of course, the internal control reporting is an annual event. So we are down to a, a fairly small group of companies by the time we're looking at this particular analysis. So to the practitioners, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about uh, what you do in your firms when you look for reasons for restatements. Do you focus on the prior years, ICFR reports, or um, you know, how do you try to get your arms around this? Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I'll grab the third rail. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, so this particular slide, and I guess this is coming off of a, a discussion point yesterday, it's like there, there's so much research that, that could come from this. Um, in, a, in our firm, yes, the, the absolutely when we come across a, uh, a restatement, not only are we trying to get our arms around um, how did it occur, why did it occur from our standpoint, we're also, if it is a, um, well, we, we dive into the internal control question of it regardless. So whether we're opining on ICFR or if management's just doing an assessment, if it is in or outside of an area where a material weakness was identified, we start asking that question. So it, it when we, we surface an error, it, there's a lot of questions asking, and there's also a lot of backwards looking to see, you know, could could this have been um, identified at, at some earlier point? Um, just th this particular, both the four percent, which I might read something into the eight, eighteen percent, is that the right number or not? It, this is where I, I personally might start really digging in from a research standpoint to to find out what's going on. Um, behind the scenes. You know, I, the, the way that I would respond to the question, it, you know, anytime you, you have a restatement, um, you know, if you have a restatement in an area that you've already identified a material weakness, then both management and the audit team ought to be taken out to the woodshed because they, they knew they had the problem and still didn't, you know, make sure that they got it sorted out before they published the financials. But what is far more common is that you get a clean ICFR report and and then you have an error, and you know, and and so there's a number of questions that present themselves. One relates to the previously issued ICFR report and whether you should, you know, sort of put a new one out there. Um, and and there's a whole set of complications, including some complications with respect to that there's not an 8K item for a, an amended um, management report. But but setting those aside. And, and it'll be interesting to see whether there's some shifting sands in the regulatory front as it relates to, to the need to refile to correct the, the ICFR report. Um, you know, what, what happens is, is you, you have to look at, all right, so, so now that we've seen that a risk event came to pass, resulted in an error, and didn't get caught timely, it's pretty easy generally to walk back and figure out what you missed. Um, and that, you know, okay, well, what are you gonna fix in your control system? All right, there's your material weakness. Uh, but the much more troubling question, and maybe this is an area where um, academia can help the profession, is what do we need to do to refine our ability to spot those more reliably? Because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about, is, is being able to spot those situations where something is going to slip through the cracks. Um, and you know, so, so sometimes it's just, it was a complete miss. The process was set up. There's no way that it was ever going to meet its objective, right? And then you have other situations where the process was set up to meet its objective, but the risks change. There's new transactions, you know, something developed in the business. For whatever reason, the process needed to be recalibrated, but the control system didn't do that timely. 
right? And, and I think, you know, in, ter in terms of where our challenge is as practitioners and somebody signing audit reports, it's, you know, how do I make sure when we go in and we evaluate how that system is set up that we've, that we're not overlooking, you know, something that's going to come to pass. And I don't think you're ever going to be perfect. Um, but, you know, there's a question of whether we can be better. Um, and, you know, and my guess is there's probably room for improvement and, you know, but it's going to be difficult to, to sort that out. So, Steve and, and Sue, I'll kind of give you guys the last word on this. Um, so you did a great job, I think, in the report. The last paragraph in the report, uh, before you get to the appendices, uh, flags that, uh, future research could investigate some of these issues uh, in here associated with material weaknesses. And so um, it's not lost on me that we are here uh, at the AAA conference. So, um, you know, thoughts about what further research might be done, uh, Sue, you uh, from an academic thinking about this, I know some of this is outside your, uh, A, outside the scope of the, the project, uh, but B, maybe outside the scope of your expertise, and then Steve from a research advisory board, any thoughts about uh, future research that academics could undertake? So, so things I would be interested in looking at, I mean, as I said, this is limited to 402 restatements and um, annual restatements. I would be very curious about how this interacts with quarterly only restatements if the, um, if the material weakness is identified, identifying that helps identify a quarterly restatement before it becomes an annual restatement. Um, I would be very interested in looking at comparisons between the 404 A and B. So the, the companies that have internal control reports both for management and auditor compared to the companies that just issue a management internal control report. Um, audit analytics has some data that suggests they have a much higher baseline rate of internal control weaknesses that are reported and I've heard very convincing discussion from the partners that that might not be what it looks like on the surface. So um, I think that's a really interesting area for further investigation that we really didn't get into at all in this study. Yeah, I would just add a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I uh, go back to Cindy's opening, and I think uh, just on the whole ICFR, I really encourage you, once it's up on the website at the CAQ, to look at yesterday's um, panel on ICFR. It, particularly if you're involved in, in, one, understanding it better, but also if you're interested on the research side, because I think it, it would enable you to raise some interesting questions yourself as you see it versus how the practitioners and the academia that were on, on the panel yesterday. Uh, secondly, it was great working with Sue on this project, but it's great when you're the re one of the reviewers versus the doer because we were constantly looking at every column and saying, well, wait a minute, that's not indicative, or what's behind that, or how does that associate you could cut this on annual, by industry, by, you know, looking at all, a lot of the measures that we looked at in this report on restatements, separate them from restatements and focus on ICFR. We're now 10 plus years in. If any of you are interested, I can go back to my many notes around this particular chapter regarding it would be interesting to see what this column or this number represents. And I think, uh, and I think we would all be served because back to Mike's point, you know, everybody wants to get it right, and, and we want to get it right consistently, and if research can help us, um, then I, I know the Research Advisory Board, the CAQ, would be very interested in, in, uh, in speaking with you further or having you submit a paper of, uh, for conducting such research. Great. Well, with that, join me in thanking Chris, Steve, Mike, and Sue. As you, as you review the study, I think you're going to see uh, what a fantastic job Sue did, and I w do want to second Steve's call that um, please do think about uh, research that uh, this might prompt in you. Uh, the CAQ is very interested in that, and the RAB uh, would very much like to hear your proposal, so uh, I do implore you to do that. So again, thank you.